Solid state drives are crazy reliable these days, but people still treat them like they're hard drives. What's more, solid state drives are crazy fast. A huge challenge in the industry, however, is that we still talk about SSD reliability in terms that like are a decade old. And for modern SSDs, that's completely useless. So today we're gonna to share data around thousands of SSDs that we've purchased for STH. And I'm gonna show you why we need to start talking about drive reliability in a completely different manner. Now, a little background here. Back in 2016, we shared data around the used enterprise SSDs that we purchased. And the reason that we purchased used enterprise SSDs is simple. Number one, we review over 50 servers a year. So we need a lot of just SSDs for that. But then also we have our own hosting clusters. We have our own test clusters, like for load generation, stuff like that. And we had a service where we allowed folks for many years to just come on different platforms and try their software out on different hardware hardware. And of course, since STH spent mostly 15 years as like tech press, we had like no budget to go do this or not a lot of budget. So what we did was we purchased a lot of used enterprise SSDs to be able to go and fill all the slots. And so ever since 2013, over a decade, we have been logging all of the SSDs that we purchase. We've been looking at how many power on hours they have, and then also how many terabytes written they have. We're also gonna have the main site article that if you wanna go dig into the numbers a little bit more, maybe take a little bit better look at some of the charts and stuff, you can go do that there. Now, of course, we are using our data. We're also gonna talk a little bit about some of the papers in the industry and stuff like that. But I do wanna say thank you to Solidime for number one, getting us some SSDs that we can show, but also they gave us some insight into their manufacturer data. It's usually a pretty closely guarded secret. and I got to learn a little bit more about what SSD reliability looks like from a manufacturer perspective when doing this piece. And so that's why you're going to see a lot of Solidime SSDs. And of course, thank you to all the STH YouTube members that help us buy a lot of the M.2 SSDs that we put in like mini PCs and stuff like that. If you can help us out, it supports cool stuff like this. Feel free to go do that by joining down below. Now, going back in time to that 2016 study, uh, this would have been like the most amazing SSD that you had seen. This is an Intel DCP 3700 800 gigabyte drive. Now we didn't have a ton of these back when we did the 2016 study because uh, they were launched in 2014 and these were very expensive drives back in the day. But they also highlighted one of the key things that happened in the early days of SSDs. We saw folks go and talk about, oh, we need high endurance drives, like, you know, seven drive rights per day, or in this case, I think it was like 17 or something like that, drive rights per day. Even if you were left sitting after this drive, was it really practical? Was that something that you needed? Did you need need seven drive rights per day, 17 drive rights per day, more or less, what was the answer? And that really was the point behind our 2016 study. We had a total of 412 used enterprise SSDs. Now at that point, we were buying these drives off of eBay, recyclers, we were buying them off our four members, just other random sources. There were all kinds of places that we were getting these drives from. But that kind of led us to realize that we had a pretty cool sample with these 412 drives because, well, they were all purchased from different sources, which which means that they represented in some ways different workloads. And that gave way to the idea that, you know, you have this NAND, the NAND actually wears out. So when you store data on the flash chips that are in here, they actually wear out over time and it becomes less reliable to be able to read what a bit of data is on the you know physical NAND. And so the industry came up with this drive rights per day metric, which essentially says this, if you take 4K completely random rights, which are basically the worst case just because of how data is mapped to the underlying chips and NAND on this SSD, right? That is how many, like how much can you do compared to the overall capacity of the drive? So on an 800 gigabyte drive, a one drive write per day drive would be 800 gigabytes. But if you had a 10 drive write per day drive, that would be eight terabytes or so. Now, of course, back then, if you have a 40 gigabyte drive, for example, it is very plausible to go write 40 gigabytes to a storage device in a day, right? And get one drive write per day. That makes a lot of sense. But when you have a 61.44 terabyte drive, well, all of a sudden, I mean, it seems a lot less practical that that's gonna happen. And if you are writing 61.44 terabytes a day, 
you're probably writing that data in a sequential manner because one of the big uses of storage these days, of course, is video files. And so if you're writing or reading a video file, that tends to be very sequential in nature. And because it's sequential, that means that the SSD is able to more efficiently map that new data to the underlying NAND. And by being more efficient, it doesn't wear out the NAND as fast. And therefore your drive writes per day on a sequential workload would be much higher than they would be on a random workload. So when you have a big drive where you're most likely writing and reading video files from it, the drive rates per day metric is even weirder. So in 2016, we were in that era where like, you know, the 240, 200 gigabyte drives, those were kind of seeming kind of small. And we were getting into that one terabyte, you know, two terabyte drive kind of range. And that kind of felt a little bit, you know, more substantial, right? You could store more types of data on an SSD because you had more capacity. And when we looked at our population of those 412 drives that we purchased in 2016, we found that 60% or about 60% of them were a one drive write per day or higher of write endurance. But of course we couldn't afford to go buy 412 a new SSD. So we're buying these used and other people were using them beforehand. So we got a way to look at how other people were using SSDs by just taking that smart data and doing the amount that was written to it over, you know, how many days they had been powered on. And that gave us a drive rights per day metric. And when we did that, we found that it was like one or 2% we're only at one drive write per day or more. And what's more, even on these lower capacity drives, about two out of three drives that we were purchasing were being used less than 0.3 drive writes per day. And especially when we were back at those smaller capacities, that was kind of like an aha moment, right? Most people were buying and we were buying SSDs that had more than three times the endurance of what they actually needed. And that has a big impact because if you get a higher drive rate per day drive, you're most likely spending more money for the same capacity. Okay, let's talk about what we've learned since 2016. And really what we did was we took the population of all the drives that we purchased for STH and all the stuff that we've run. And we looked at, you know, okay, here's the drives that we purchased since 2016. And we bucketed those into a couple of different buckets because I think that's a really important part of this. The first bucket that we used was really looking at what are the drives that we purchased that were essentially new. And here's why. If it's a new drive, it's gonna have zero terabytes written and also zero power on hours, or at least it should. And so that didn't really seem like something that was worthwhile including in this result. And we purchased about a third of our drives new. So those were just ones that we had to exclude. And one other thing that we had to do was we had to remove the Intel Optane drives. Now I know that's gonna be one that a lot of people are gonna be really freaked out about. And we have used a lot of Optane drives over the years and a lot of Optane dims and all that kind of stuff. But here's the reason why. The low end Optane drives tend to have about a 10 drive write per day endurance rate. And if you go to the top end, you tend to have something like a hundred drive writes per day. And so even if we looked at something like an Intel 9 P drive, like 280 gigabytes, super small. Just frankly, we didn't find any that were even close to even one drive right per day. So had we kept those drives in there, it would have skewed results to a crazy degree. And so we removed those. And over the years, we also had a couple of drives that were just completely one off, like weird purchases. And we removed anything that we didn't have at least two of. I think actually our minimum was four for a particular drive type. And that in total left us with 1,347 drives. Now of that 1,347, 28 of them were SAS SSDs. Another 155 were SATA SSDs. And you might wonder why the heck do you have SATA and SAS in there? Just remember that back in 2016, 2017, it was a lot more common to use things like SATA and SAS rather than today where a lot of storage that we, at least servers that we use tend to be NVMe based servers. So that leaves 1,164 drives that are NVMe drives. So of those drives, we have 24 adding cards, which those just are less popular because they take a PCIe slot, but we still use them. And we even use them in our hosting clusters a while back. And the other thing that we had was 92 M.2 SSDs. Now you might ask, why do you have 92 M.2 SSDs over, I don't know, seven and a half years or so. And the reason is really simple. When we install a lot of like servers, we'll end up using M.2 SSDs just as boot devices. Sometimes we'll mirror those as well. But the other side to that is kind of obvious. If we're using them as boot drives, then I think a lot of other folks are probably using them as boot drives as well. So we would expect those to not necessarily have the you know highest drive rights per day just because they're boot drives. Now, 1,048 of the drives are 
U.2 or U.3 drives, so two and a half inch NVMe drives. And that's really the bulk of the drives that we're looking at today. And let's just cut to the chase and make this really easy for you. There is a total of one drive in all of these 1,347 drives. There's one of them that was actually written to more than its drive ride per day rating would suggest. And that was an Intel 750 drive, which is an old drive. It was like an NVMe add-in card a lot of times or, or U.2 drive that was like a super low endurance. I think it was like a 0.2 drive rights per day drive. I think some people bought those, put them in servers or maybe just decided to do a lot of benchmarking on them or something. And they totally blew through a lot of the uh, drive endurance. And so I think that's how we got that one. But the vast majority of our other drives were at least 0.3 drive rights per day or more. And that really meant that frankly, we weren't even close to that. And perhaps because they had low endurance and we had that one outlier drive, we really saw the drive rights per day on average for our Intel 750 series, I think was just over 1.1. Our next kind of sets of drives were really lower, uh, just lower quantity drives. And even those were like four times better. So that means that the amount that you are rated for versus the amount that was actually written, you're at least 4X. Now, looking at the Intel drives that are now Solidime drives, if you were to take a look at those, you would see that the vast majority of these are much smaller drives, like 400 gigs or 800 gigs in capacity. And the reason for that is just, frankly, we a lot of times need to fill slots in systems. We don't necessarily need a ton of capacity when we have like test systems just for our, you know, test infrastructure, what we call demo eval. We had an average drive rights per day rating of about 3.6. Six, but what we actually saw was our average drive rights per day on the drives that other people were using was something like a 0.39. And something else that really stuck out in this population was that that 0.39 was skewed actually by the lower drives. We had so many 400 gig, 800 gig drives that those tended to be uh, a lot higher. But once we got to something like a you know 3.84 terabyte or 7.68 terabyte drive and like that, that class, we saw that we were well under 0.2 drive rights per day. So again, that bolsters the idea that as these drives get bigger, you're storing larger chunks of information. So you're doing more sequential writes, but also, you know, you're doing more reads than writes. So you're not just using these as write cache devices. And really skewing these numbers is all the S3700s and S3710s that I ended up buying a long time ago because uh, apparently they had been used a lot because those had over one drive write per day on average. Of course, the average on those was like 1.1, 1.6, somewhere in that range. And so, uh, you know, these are 10 drive write per day drives. So they're not necessarily the, um, I, I just don't think that they were even close to being used up and people were definitely overbuying them, but the same people probably would have been okay with a three drive write per day drive. Although I will say that there was one S3710 that I think was at like 8.8 .8 or so drive writes per day. So I think just got just absolutely hammered. To me, at least the key takeaway after looking through all this data is just that people are way over buying their SSDs. Smaller SSDs tended to be a little bit closer or a lot closer to their drive write per day rating. But then once we got to, you know, multi terabyte drives, it's really uncommon that we see folks that are really pushing the drives and really writing that much data to it. Even one drive write per day has become pretty uncommon, at least from what we're seeing from other people using these drives. And I just want to point out that others and like hyperscalers have looked at this, they have much larger data sets, but they pretty much found similar things where most of the workloads are very read heavy and instead of being write heavy. So I think that the key thing that we learned here was just really, um, you don't need that much write endurance, right guys? Like if you're getting a 10 drive write per day or more drive and uh, you're not using it in something that is just gonna get absolutely hammered 24 seven, then I think you're overbuying. Of course, we're gonna have more charts and stuff on the STH main site. So if you wanna take a little bit more time to just kind of read through some insights and kind of take a look at stuff, I would definitely go there. We'll link that in the description as well. Okay, so let's get back to it and let's talk a little bit more about SSD reliability because that's something I needed Solidime's help for. Now in the industry, most folks use AFR, or Annualized Failure Rate, as the key metric for reliability of drives. And for SSDs, the AFR figure that you commonly see is a number that's maybe on the high end, like 0.5%. Now I did mention, I talked to Solidime about this. They didn't want to give the exact number or anything like that, but I would say that it's fair to say that some vendors, at least one that I know of, and just from our personal experience, is that a maybe a 0.2 and change AFR would be a pretty generous figure these days for SSDs. And when SSDs were small compared to hard drives, Thank you. 
Well, you know, that was kind of like that kind of niche storage. Nobody really thought about it for arrays, but now SSDs are so much larger. They're three times as big as hard drives and getting even bigger. And so the AFR metric becomes really interesting. The reason for that is that for hard drives, people will use like a 5% AFR and, you know, other folks will say, oh, it's closer to like two and a half percent or something like that. But, you know, the two and a half to 5% range is pretty common in the industry. So taking a step back, that probably means that your SSD is something like 10 times more reliable than a hard drive. Plus, you need fewer devices if you have a large SSD. And you got to remember the way that a lot of service contracts were originally priced. If you wake up in the morning, you think, oh, my service contract with a large vendor is like percent of the list price of a server. Well, the reason for that was remember back in the day when you have hard drives failing at 5% a year or 2.5% a year, if you have a bunch of servers, you're probably seeing the you know repair guy come in and replace those drives on a pretty regular basis. We had a rack that we literally didn't visit for three years. When we finally went back, it was to replace a hard drive, one of the two hard drives that was in the entire rack. All the, everything else was SSD at this point and they were all fine. Now, of course, with like two hard drives and maybe hundred SSDs, it wasn't necessarily a statistically relevant number by any means. But one thing that we did because we realized the SSD reliability was getting so good was that years ago we switched to, instead of buying expensive service contracts, we just bought extra like systems and we just have hot spares and cold spares. So that way, if a system dies, we can just turn on a new one and then go check it out whenever we need to. Now, a lot of people have in their models like these very expensive service contracts. But the fact of the matter is you can a lot of times just get away with just having cold spares these days because servers have become so much more reliable. And that kind of brings us to our next topic, which is that reliability and how that impacts arrays. Because when you have something like a storage array, whether that's a RAID array, maybe you know, you're know you just using some kind of really cool DPU eraser coding scheme or something, or maybe you just have like a Ceph cluster and you're using replication or Gluster or something like that. When a device fails, you generally put a new device in and that drive has to go and take all that data that was on the failed drive and go rebuild it and put, populate it onto that new drive. Let's say that your array is only able to sustain a single device failure, well, then until you have that new device come in and, and ready and rebuilt, well, you don't have any more redundancy, which means until that operation is complete, if a drive fails, you're going to lose data. So if you want to look more into that, it's called Mean Time to Recovery or MTTR. And a lot of folks will talk about this and there are you know, papers on this and all that kind of stuff. But if you have a hard drive versus an SSD, a lot of times your rebuild speeds are like 10x the speed on SSDs. So one of the reasons that we've switched even lower endurance SSDs is because even the lower endurance ones tend to be more reliable and rebuild faster. So just to recap everything in our key lessons learned, which I love to have in all of our videos, back in 2016, we found that there was a massive difference of when we purchased used SSDs between the drive rights per day rating of a drive and what people were actually using when we purchased our random samples. And when we updated the study for our 2024 data set, we found that people were doing the exact same thing, except to a greater extent, way over buying drives based on drive rights per day. And as we get to larger drives, 61.44 terabyte, or in the future, 122.88 terabyte drives, that drive right per day metric starts to look even sillier. Let's face it, on a big drive like this, you're most likely gonna be storing things like video. You're not gonna be doing 4K random writes 100% of the time to the drive. That's almost silly. Instead, usage pattern on SSDs tends to be like some data gets written every once in a while and then it gets read back quite often. Solidime has this manufacturer data which is much better than what we have much larger population and they say that it's more like a 90-10 rule where like 90% of the workload is read, 10% is write, and that write workload of course is not all 4k random. So even the commonly used 70-30 read write that we use to benchmark SSDs, th that's just something that is not really realistic as the drives get larger. And now that we're talking about devices with, you know, terabytes of capacity being written, you know, for like tens of petabytes of like total lifetime writes, it makes the comparison to hard drives even sillier. Oftentimes modern hard drives have ratings somewhere in the like annual, like annual workload ratings of somewhere in that like 180 to 550 terabytes per year. Just giving you some sense, that's like the 61.44 terabyte drive, like three times 
or like 10 times a year, less than 10 times a year, right? So it's just kind of crazy that you would even, even kind of compare those. And maybe that means that it's time to stop using drive rights per day. Now, hey, if you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends and colleagues? I think we need to get the word out on this. But also, if you did like this video, well, give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.